Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Um, I don't know whether you remember, um, a few weeks ago, I uh, brought um, a thought to you about uh, how the fact that um, we often get our understanding of the gospel and even the way of salvation from more from Paul than we do from Jesus. And uh, we were looking at all the ways that Jesus interacted with people as he walked the earth and how many different ways he told them that they could find eternal life or have whatever, enter the kingdom if they did certain things, but everything was different. I don't know whether you remember that. And um, what I did uh, sort of end the, the uh, sort of the, the preach with was how he uh, quoted in the book of Luke, he quotes from the book of Isaiah. And he says that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to preach deliverance to the captive, sight to the blind, uh, deliverance for the oppressed, and the year of the Lord's favor. And then it says he shut the book. Now, that has been an absolute blessing to me because um, uh, what we've got in this, and we need to really get it into our hearts, that the God of Jesus is not a God of vengeance. And that's why the line and, and, and the day of God's vengeance, which is said in uh, Isaiah, he missed that line off. Because as far as he was concerned, the God that he knew, the God that he wanted to deliver to the people was not a God of vengeance. Uh, now, I've been having a look, and it's been interesting. Um, I love to do research, and I've been having a look at all the other uh, Old Testament um, things, uh, or should I say scriptures that uh, Jesus quoted, and it's really quite interesting. Because if you really look at it, um, he, well, he actually only, if you want to get down to technicalities, he uh, only quotes 59. Why 59? It's probably more of duplicates, but there's 59 separate statements that he quotes from the Old Testament. And um, uh, I, I can give you the list if you want of, of the actualities, but that's not really important. The point that I want to make is that he tends to keep away from all the, the, the harsh judgmental stuff. None of that. Um, he ignores things like num the book of Numbers. He doesn't ever repeat the book of Numbers. I mean, that's really interesting, isn't it? Um, because it's rather ritualistic and legalistic. That's interesting. He never quotes from Joshua or Judges which are full of sanctified violence. That's nice to know, isn't it? Um, Jesus doesn't quote from his own scriptures when, when they are punitive, listen to this, imperialistic, classist, exclusionary. In fact, he, te he teaches the exact opposite. Now, I find that amazing. So you've got a whole bunch of scriptures that are in our Bible that Jesus almost doesn't want out to do with. Now, that's got to be something that's interesting for us. Don't you think? He doesn't mention the list of 28 thou shalt nots in Leviticus. That's great, because you'd think that all Christianity was about thou shalt nots, but he don't mention them. And in fact, he chooses instead to uh, quote the pos more positive quote of Leviticus 19, because he does actually quote from Leviticus, where he talks about loving your neighbor as yourself. Nice, eh? Isn't that lovely? Um, and then, of course, it talks, uh, uh, the longest thing, he, the quote he makes is the one that I mentioned a few minutes ago about um, the one from Isaiah, which is saying really what his mission was. And I think, what a mission statement. So, uh, Joel preached, was it last week or the week before? I, I'm sorry, I'm a bit lost of time at the minute where, where I am. Uh, but he was talking about, it is finished, now what? And I think that's a great question. It is finished. Now what? Now, you see, if we're living in the year of the Lord's favor, 
what we should be doing, the now what, should be the ushering in of the Lord's favour for all people of all races, whoever they are. It should be, we are wanting to bring release for the captives, d uh, deliverance of the oppressed, um, opening of uh, eyes of the blind. And don't get mixed up there. When we're talking about the eyes of the blind, it's not necessarily talking about blindness as in a sickness of blindness. It's more talking about being blind in the fact that you can't, can't see for looking, basically, because you can have the truth right in front of your face and still not see it. And this was the, 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 the blindness that Jesus was saying, look, I've come to, to, to bring this. So what were the characteristics of this year of the Lord's favour? And I think, you know, I'm just really recapping a little bit before I get on with what I want to say tonight. The characteristics of this year of the Lord's favour, which was actually a picture of this uh, event called Jubilee, where basically all debts were cancelled, all land was given back, and it was basically a new start for everyone. It didn't matter what a mess you had made of your existence for that 50 years, but when that 50th year came, boy, you were going to get a brand new start. Now, we don't think like that in, in the terms of uh, our society. But you see, in this culture and in this, this uh, society, this is what they did. It was, it was a known thing. There was a period where it was coming and people got excited. Talk about the year of hope. They got excited because they knew, regardless of all that was messed up, regardless of all that had been lost. And remember, some people didn't lose things because they were stupid. They lost things because they were under oppressive governments who might pinch their land or what have you. Or, or they might have had to get rid of, uh, sell a piece of land because um, they had to pay the taxes of the, uh, of the land. Um, so the reason why they lost things wasn't the point. It was the fact that they could look forward with hope to this day when they could get a new start. Now, this is the year of the Lord's favour. And what I want to be able to say to you tonight, that this isn't about something that's coming. It's about something that is now. And each of you can look at your life and you could say, I wish I didn't do X, or I wish I hadn't done Y, or I wish so-and-so hadn't done A, or whatever to me. The point is, if we understand the year of the Lord's favour, we can actually say this can be a new start for me right now in this moment because of what the vision was of Jesus when he came to the earth. So it's about participating in bringing in this peaceable kingdom, releasing what's already given now here into this reality. Right? So Jesus was the li a living symbol of what I call, and this is funny because I don't know how else to say it, the Sabbath slash Jubilee slash it is finished kingdom. Can we have that? Because he's got them all there. And so take, take whatever you want and have a look at it. Okay. And Isaiah 56 s sets it out lovely. And I just want to just have a look at it very quickly because it basically talks about, if I can find it, come on, where are you? Oh, I didn't know I had as many notes as this. Hey, you're going to be here till 10 o'clock. Isaiah 56 one says this, Keep justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps from defiling the Sabbath. Now, that, the Sabbath, is so important because by the time I get to the end, I'm going to tell you how we can defile the Sabbath. I'm not going to tell you right now. Is that okay? I'll tell you in a bit. But you see, all that, if you carry on reading Isaiah 56, it's talking about whatever you do, do not reject the foreigner. Don't ex uh, reject the person who's in trouble. Don't reject the poor. Don't reject the, the, the sick. Because this is my mission, to bring them all into the kingdom and make everything right again. It's great, because I'm not reading the whole thing, I'll, so I'll now find my place, if that's okay. Okay, where am I? Where am I? Okay, so, debts released, 
and, and debt, we're, we're all indebted to something. We all think money when we talk about debt. But we, we've got debts of unforgiveness, haven't we? We've got debts of, of, of hurt that we, we carry. We've got debts in the context that we feel we owe ourselves because we've not lived up to our own expectations. Yeah, there's all sorts of debts, but these debts are going to be released. There's also a lovely characteristic of neighbour care. I preached it last week. Who is my neighbour? Who's your Samaritan? In this kingdom, this peaceable kingdom, you better know who your neighbour is. You better know who your Samaritan is in that sense and decide. I've been told in this peaceable kingdom, I've got to care for my neighbour. Oh, this is when we all say, well, I don't like this anymore. I'm off. You know, let's just sing another song. But no, right? So we've got debts, release, forgivenesses, neighbour care. And then the last one, which we bring up quite often, enemy love. Now, we don't often get to enemy love because we still won't take care of our neighbour most of the time. So we ain't going to have much luck with the enemy love, are we? But these are the characteristics of the kingdom and we see that this is how Jesus operates uh, from the moment that he shuts the book after he's read this chapter that was in Isaiah. Now, have I made that clear? Because that was a bit of a recap of the other week. So... The book of Mark, which is one of the Gospels, gives us real insight into Jesus' operation. Because Mark is, a, is, is a, a, a book about the common people of the day, just the ordinary people. And most of the time, it was a society of very downtrodden people because they were oppressed by the Romans that had come in, that, that there'd been a terrible uh, oppression. And so Mark is actually bringing those people to the fore and showing how Jesus dealt with them. And it's absolutely wonderful. So the disease, the poor, the disenfranchised, Jesus was ushering in a new order. And remember what we've said? It was about uh, the day of the Lord's favour, making sure that people understood. And I'll get to it, but I'll say it now. Our job as 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 people who claim to be followers of Jesus, is to usher in a new order. It's not about, and I'll get to it in a minute, about basically converting the lost. It's actually sharing this new order with everybody we come across. There is a new order. And most of the time, we don't get down to sharing the new order because like what with the the, the film, I thought it was great what uh, Claire showed. We're so busy deciding what's right and what's wrong. We, we actually don't get round to sharing the good news. Wouldn't it be lovely if the attitude of, of that uh, video was everybody deciding what really was a brilliant aspect, something that they couldn't do without in their lives and sharing it is the best piece of news they could possibly have. Do, do you see what I mean? Instead, it's all, you should be doing it this way. It should have been, do you know what? This saved my life and I want you to know about it. Wouldn't that be better? So anyway, that's, that's the issue of the kingdom. So we start the book of Mark with Jesus' baptism. And, you know, the, 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 the dove comes down out of the sky and he says, this is my beloved son. Uh, I'm pleased with him. And he, he, he starts his ministry. And then he immediately goes in. And I'm not going to talk about all this stuff. I'm just giving you pictures, if that's okay. He then is led into the wilderness and he's tempted by what seems to be the devil. Now, I'm not going to get into that because, uh, yeah, I've got my own thoughts about that, but we're not going there tonight. But if you want to, I'll take you there. We can go there if you want. But anyway, um, but then this is what happens and it's brilliant. Chapter 1, verse 16. So we're only 16 verses into the whole thing. He goes to find these fishermen uh, and he says to them, follow me. And I will make you become fishers of men. And it says, they immediately left their nets and they followed him. So this is 16 verses into his ministry. He's already getting some people to say, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Now, come on, be honest. Who's heard that phrase, I will make you fishers of men? Do you want to put up that picture for me? If you can. What does it mean to become fishes? Oh, it's not coming. Have we not got it? Never mind. If it comes up, that's fine. We've heard it so many times. I heard it in Sunday school. There was a song that I used to sing about. 
there you go, where these two very well-meaning Christian people are being fishers of men and they've caught him nicely in his mouth and I'm sure it's very, very painful. Now, is that what we mean? Is that, I think that's what a lot of people have thought it was because the whole idea of being fishers of men is the idea that it's a call to evangelism, isn't it? To getting out there and getting your fishing rod, throwing it out there, hooking somebody, pull them in, pulling them in. And what was on the end of the hook? Well, it's, it's uh, the, the hook being the message of the gospel, you know, the bait, um, supposedly the good news, uh, one size fits all approach, you know, where you have to do this, 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 and this. And if you do it, you must be born again, bait, yeah? Or how about turn or burn, bait? Do you like that one? What about believe all the right things, bait? And so we put it in and we they swallow it and we reel them in to do what? To either put them in a big goldfish bowl like this, where everybody's watching everything that you do, yeah? Or if we take the analogy to its full conclusion, if you're going to just use them as fish, basically you kill a fish and you eat it. So, I mean, we're not going to do that, are we? So that's a bit silly. But are you following me? If you're going to use the analogy. So the, the, we're hoping that basically with our fishing analogy that we're going to literally pull people out of the wrong paths that they're on, out of the, the water of the world, into a different environment where everything's going to be all right. So we usually mean then that we've pulled people from their wicked ways and basically everybody now becomes a church attender in this wonderful goldfish bowl called the church. That's how it feels sometimes though, doesn't it? Now here's the question. Is that what Jesus meant? Now I get very nervous when I talk like this because I think we do challenge our thoughts and when we've held a particular view of a, of a thing for a very long time, it's often hard to let go of it. But remember, we've got to look at things in the context of how Jesus was operating. And if you go from this, him calling these people to say, I will make you fishers of men, then to see what he did with those disciples, I guarantee he did none of this, throwing it out, reeling people in and putting them in a church and saying, this is what you're going to do from now on. You're going to sit, you're going to pray, you're going to uh, listen to sermons, you're going to sing, and that's it, basically, that's your life. What he wanted to do, he was wanting to, to get these people to outwork his vision of the peaceable kingdom within a society where the people were so oppressed that they actually felt and understood the, the year of the Lord's favour. Okay. So, if we do a bit of research, you find that what these fishermen, which they were, they were fishermen, they knew how to do the job and they left the nets, their instruments of how they produced a living to embark on a new vocation that has actually got prophetic connections. And if you do a bit of research and a bit of looking in concordances and, and following uh, some, some, you know, just follow a little, little path, you find that the reference to fishes of men that is in the Old Testament is not about converting people, but it's actually dealing with oppressors. Now that's weird, isn't it? Because you think, hang on, we've always associated being a fisher of men with the gospel and reeling in people into the kingdom. So who are the ones that need catching, as far as Jesus is concerned, in the analogy of the fishing rod and bringing the fish in? Well, if you look at Jeremiah 16, verse 16, now some of you might think, heck, what on earth is she on about? But I think you'll, you'll, you'll find it interesting. He says, Behold, I will send for many fishermen, says the Lord. So he's talking about fishermen. And they shall fish them, and afterwards I will send for my hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of holes of, of the rocks. For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity hidden from my eyes. So you see, the, 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 the uh, 
purpose of the fishermen in this is to actually search out those who have actually been oppressing the people of Israel, which at the time in Jeremiah, I believe, and Anthony can correct me if I'm wrong, it was talking about the Egyptians who had oppressed the children of Israel for a very, very long time. So he says, I'm going to sort you out and I'm going to fish you out. Fishermen, right? If you look then at Ezekiel 29, this is another reference to Pharaoh of Egypt. Listen to this, you'll like this. I will put hooks in your jaws and cause the fish of your rivers to stick to your scales and I will bring you up out of the midst of the rivers. And he's saying, basically, I'm going to catch you with a fishing rod. You think, heck, what's going on here? And then when we get down, oh, and it's all because, listen to this, this is good. At the end of Ezekiel, it says, this is why I'm going to do this. Um, because when they, meaning my people, took hold of you with the hand, you broke and tore all their shoulders. And when they leaned on you, you broke and made all their backs quiver. So you see, any, any idea of an oppressive attitude towards God's people, he says, I'm going to fish. I'm literally going to fish you. The hook of the fishing rod is actually going to go to you. How do I find that interesting? Another one. Oh, I don't know who the cows of Bashan are. It's great, the language in the Bible. But Bashan, I understand there were giants in Bashan, so they're all a bit weird in there. But it says this, hear this word, you who oppress the poor, you who crush the needy, I will take you away with fish hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. So you see, we have a whole different view of being fishers of men by this. Now you say, hang on, what's going on? Well, if we understand that the fishy, fishing hooks are for those who have created oppression for people, you can see why Jesus would say to the disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of what sort of men? Men who were in the society who were bringing oppression to the people. And so we see that uh, basically to be a fisher of men is to be willing to move anything by a hook. I, I hope you're getting this because I think you'll find it interesting in the end. By the sense of a hook to pull out of the way anything that stands in the way of Jesus and his Sabbath slash jubilee slash it is finished vision, Right? Dismantle any structure that gets in the way of God getting to the people and anything that doesn't bring release. And we see that in the book of Mark, this is going on a lot and we'll talk about that in a minute. See, the lost, the needy, the disenfranchised, they weren't the ones who need to be caught. They actually needed to be released. Do you see it? When the oppressors were out of the way, the exodus could be realized. What Anth was talking about, the liberation, the freedom, the order that would come with Christ and his peaceable kingdom could be accessed. But it would never be accessed while ever there were oppressors in the way. Now, who were the oppressors? There was a lot of them. And sadly, the majority of, the, of them were not the Romans. It was the... It was the um, the Pharisees and the scribes and even the Jewish people themselves. Now, this is not anti-Semitic. I'm just talking about at the time who wouldn't accept people. We talked about last week, the Samaritans weren't accepted. Why? Because they were half Jewish. So they were refused access. So there, were, there was, like um, Claire said, about not being willing to be kind to each other. So after Jesus calls the the fishers of men, what is recorded in the book of Mark. And it's absolutely wonderful. The pictures of release, Sabbath action is happening. It's just amazing. The it is finished day. It's amazing. The first two chapters, we have the characteristics of this wonderful thing going on. We have release, we have neighbor care, we have enemy love. And we also have how the Pharisees felt about it. Okay. So, in, um, it's interesting, chapter 1, you have uh, Jesus in the temple. 
And remember, he's taken these disciples, these fishermen who have left the nets to, to pick up this new vocation. He's taken them to say, look, this is what we're going to do now. So everybody who was excluded, they were now the prime targets of all the favour. Now, I just love this. What's the first part of call? Now, okay, this guy's got an unclean spirit. Guess where he was? He was in the temple. Guess where he shouldn't have been? In the temple. But how fantastic. He was in the temple the day Jesus was there. And you know what was amazing? He says this. And I've heard people say that the words he spoke was not him, but it was the spirit who was speaking. But I don't know. As I read it today, I'm thinking I'm not sure because he said, what are you doing here basically? Did you come to destroy us? This is the person talking to Jesus. Interesting, isn't it? amazing that in fact that's what most people think when Jesus or anything to do with God turns up what is the first thought they have about God and Jesus have you come to destroy us not necessary an evil spirit speaking just the guy okay I, you know I've heard all about God throughout the Old Testament when he turns up people get zapped yeah Hey, you only have to read the Old Testament. And the, the, this fellow probably had his fill of it. So he immediately says, have you come to destroy us? And of course, it was the whole uh, the story. You're not welcome. We can't have you. you, might, you you've got mental issues or you've got this, you've got that. You're not welcome. You, you can't be involved here. So what happens? Hey, he's delivered. Woo! From whatever it was. And we can talk about that as well if you want to another time. He can't eat Jesus cut says, I'll tell you what, you think I'm here to destroy you? I'm here to set you free. Awesome. Verse 31, Peter's mother-in-law, sick, she gets healed. Then verse 32, the very next verse, she's still in the same Sabbath day, so two wonderful things have happened that day. Many healed and delivered, it says. Verse 40, there's the healing of a, a man with leprosy. Then we get to chapter two, the paralytic man. Remember what we talked about, the, 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 the hooks in the mouth, the being fishermen, is actually dismantling anything that gets in the way of people being brought to Jesus. What's the story of the paralytic man? The friends get on the roof, dismantle the house to bring him to Jesus. The disciples are watching, the, the, the fishermen are watching and saying, oh, this is great. Because where were the hooks going? In the mouths of the Pharisees who are saying, how dare you say to this man, your sins are forgiven you. But Jesus said, I'm getting, I'm moving you out of the way. My fishermen, I'm showing my fishermen how to get rid of the oppressive spirit that stops people getting to Jesus. Is this making sense? I hope so. So we've got brought by, by friends. You've got your neighbor care there. Somebody caring for, I love it. And I said it the other week. How amazing that it says that the faith of the friends saved him. Some of you aren't activating your own faith for some of your friends. You're waiting for them to make some sort of decision instead of you saying, you know, my, my faith is going to make them whole. So anyway, oh, hang on, yeah. The, the Pharisees were absolutely appalled by what Jesus was doing because it's like a bit like the film we watched on Luther, about Luther because it was messing up their organization because basically you can imagine by people remaining sick or people remaining under this oppression, they actually got very rich by it. And once Jesus came on the scene and says, no, we're not playing this game anymore, they got rattled because they didn't like that. Anyway, verse 13, then you get a tax collector who was absolutely the lowest of the low, rejected by everybody. He, he gets called, and guess what his name was? Matthew, awesome. That's the, uh, the one who's got the book after him. And, and they're getting all upset again, these Pharisees. They're saying, how come that he has anything to do with tax collectors and these sinners? Anyway, by verse 23, this is still in, I think it's still in oh, chapter 2, We've got a Sabbath again. I love this. We've had, we've had a Sabbath already. 
Remember what we talked about, the Sabbath being this jubilee, year of favour exp experience. And then we're back on the Sabbath. And then what happens is Jesus goes through the grain fields. And uh, with, with his fishermen, with his fishermen, remember, he says, I'll make you fishers of men. And he pulls uh, some grain and he, and he eats it. And the Pharisees absolutely hit the roof because they're saying, this is, this is not right. Now, you see, some people have, have, have said, well, he, you know, he didn't keep the law. But actually, Jesus was keeping the law, absolutely, keeping the Sabbath. Because in order to keep the spirit of the Sabbath, the thing was to, to feed the hungry. And yet the Pharisees are saying, how dare you? The law is more, more important than feeding the hungry. So Jesus is saying, I'll tell you what, anything that stands in the way, I'm going to fish you out of the way. So we have this all upset. And he said to them, uh, lovely words, the Sabbath, this freedom, this day, this it is finishedness, this jubilee was made for man, not man made for the Sabbath. It's this, this experience is for man. Oh, it's amazing. So it all gets worse because on that same day, that same Sabbath, that same attitude towards this wonderful um, uh, uh, operation that Jesus had, he heals a man with a withered hand. So I'm not kidding you, that was the last straw for the, for the Pharisee, Pharisees because they decided that that's it. He's broke our laws, he, he, he ate, um, took grain on the Sabbath day, and he's also healed this man. So he said, right, we're going to kill him. Now, I just find that absolutely amazing because we have here, you've broke our laws, so we are going to kill you. Which one of their laws were they just totally miss, missing? Do you remember missing the point? So you can't eat grain, you can't heal this man, but we can kill you. Ah, see? And I believe that what Jesus is showing these fishermen is these are the ones you need to fish out of the way. These are the ones we need to move. These are the ones we need to put hooks in their mouths and move. So he withdraws. He does more healings. And then in verse 22, we have this, uh, this, this issue. And this is where I want to get to tonight. And it's, it's, I think you'll find it interesting. Mark 3 says, so he called himself up. Oh, sorry, I have to tell you a little bit of the story. They all get together and they decide he is Satan. Jesus must be Satan because he's doing all these things and, and it's all against their, their uh, idea of what is right, so he must be Satan. So what happens is he calls them to him and he says, look, how can Satan cast out Satan? A kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. Then this is what I want to look at. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Now, remember we're talking about the fact that there was a regime in place that was totally oppressing the people. They had plunder in, in, in the the house of, of God, in a sense, in the temple because of all of the taxes and all of the, the things that they would put on the people. Now, we have been taught in the past that, that the strong man was Satan who we fought in order to release people from the hands of Satan. But in fact, what you've got here, you've got the fact that people are being held captive by a strong man in, in a house which... When we go further down into Mark 11, you get the story of Jesus going into the temple and in essence, binding the strong man in order that the people who ought to be in the temple could be there. I hope, I, I don't know if I can say that again, but I hope you're getting the, the gist. Because you see, the idea is, in Mark 3, we're thinking, oh, he's talking about binding the enemy and this, that, and the other. But he's actually talking about binding up the strong man who might be the one who's got this religious idea of who's allowed in and who's not allowed. And when Jesus goes then down 
to the temple, he actually puts this into practice. And listen to what he says. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry. And the word wears there actually means plunder. It's all that they'd taken that day from poor people who could hardly afford to eat, but they were saying, unless you bring this, you aren't accepted. Unless you pay this, you, you can't get through to God. Can you see why Jesus was saying, we're having none of this, and what he was basically doing with his whip was almost a picture of the, the rod. He says, my house should be called a house of prayer. And I know Anne's brought this many times before, but that word prayer means a house of inclusion. We think prayer, kneeling down, praying. No, house of prayer. Now what's interesting, you could, either, you could say that what it had become was a house of prey because somebody was praying on the poor, the needy. And instead of them being released into the, the favour, the year of the Lord's favour, they were being prayed upon. So Jesus had just bound the strong man, exercised the extortion and puts a stop to the plundering of the people and the temple becomes that free space for those it was originally intended. So Jesus makes a declaration that day that the temple is a house of inclusion. Now, there is a, a funny little bit, and I don't know if I've got time to do it, but after he's talked about binding the strong man, it's very, very interesting that in chapter 3, verse 28, he goes on after he talks about uh, unless you bind the strong man first, you can't plunder plunders his goods. He goes on to talk about what's called the unforgivable sin. Now, I don't know whether any of you have come across that. It's, it's been talked about over the years and many people come for counseling because they're not sure whether they've ever committed it or not. Anybody familiar with any of this? And it's funny that, or funny, not funny, haha, but funny, peculiar, that it actually is there in the text. Why should it be there in the text? Because you see, I believe that what it's getting at, and I mean, I'm a little bit concerned because it can I read it to you? Because it is a bit weird, so I'll just read it. It says this. Assured, assured, uh, 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 assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit uh, will never be forgiven, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Now, that's really hard stuff, isn't it? And this is supposedly coming out of the mouth of Jesus. So there's a lot to talk about there, and we haven't got time to talk about it tonight, because I could actually say, if we take the first bit, it says, all sins will be forgiven, and whatever blasphemies they may utter will be forgiven, but you won't be if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. That, to me, is like weird, because if all blasphemies can be forgiven... Well, then why can't the one against the Holy Spirit be forgiven? So I don't get it, and I'm not pretending that I get it. I, I don't get it, and I will work on it. But for me, the issue is here, that what you have is a picture of people who constantly oppress. And people who constantly oppress and masquerading as spiritually oppressing people in the name of God... We have an issue here that they never see what they are doing. Therefore, they never feel that they're doing anything wrong. And on that basis, there becomes almost a position they put themselves in that can never be pardoned. Because if there's never a point where you're willing to accept that you're not in, the, in a good place, how can their pardon come to you? Now, you see, just for today, let's call it this. Those who entrap those who oppress, but actually do it masquerading as some form of spirituality, they have hardened their hearts so bad that they actually don't even realize that they need to be pardoned. Now, that's the way I would look at it for now. But you see, just bringing it to, to an end, mislabeling the 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 need of people who need deliverance 
and, and basically charging them like indulgences in order to say, you pay this and you're going to be okay. Do you, th do you think that God finds that acceptable? Not at all. And you see, this is what the, uh, the, the Pharisees were doing in the name of God. So, um, evil when masked as spiritual devotion. And there's another scripture that talks about when you put burdens on people's backs that they can't bear, all in the name of God. See, I think that everything can be forgiven and pardoned. I really do. I think it all can. But the point we have here is that when we uh, get to the place where the, the, the Sabbath slash jubilee slash it is finished attitude is not being professed by us to the world, we get to a place where our hearts, hearts become very hard. And then it's difficult for us to find that pardon that we need because we don't believe that we need it. So... Isaiah 56 talks about all those who keep from defiling the Sabbath. I really like this. How do we defile the Sabbath? We defile the Sabbath when we actually live contrary to what Jesus said in his Isaiah 61 uh, um, delivery. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has chosen me to preach the good news to the poor, to release the captives, to uh, minister sight, bring sight to the blind, to release those who have been in prison and to preach the year of the Lord's favor. Now, that brings us a total uh, different understanding of keeping the Sabbath. It's not about having a day where you decide this day is going to be special and I might go and go to church or whatever. That's not what the Sabbath is about. The sab Sabbath is about this overwhelming blanket release to the whosoever. And you know what? Once we get that understanding in our hearts, it does something to us. Because once we understand our need of a Sabbath for us, then it some somehow is the word like it, it, it humanizes us in the understanding of the need that everybody else needs of a Sabbath experience. So we want to keep the Sabbath slash it is finished slash jubilee because it calls us back from judgments and exclusivity and destructive attitudes. So here's the thing, and I, I've probably confused a lot of you. If this is what Jesus really meant about being a fisher of men, then are you ready to fish in a different sort of way? Instead of fishing to sort of convert people to your brand of understanding, or, and I, I thought again it was good what Claire said, God speaks to us all very differently. He teaches us things in different ways. We go through experiences where we understand things also differently. And so, are we willing to actually decide that we're going to embrace the idea of this Sabbath, it is finished experience, and be willing to overturn the existing order that exists that's oppressing people, to tell them, I'm bringing you out, I'm actually allowing you to come free because I'm going to stand in the way of oppression uh, uh, that's in your way. Because when we live in this we release captives, we bring sight to the blind, freedom for, for the prisoner, and we proclaim constantly the year of the Lord's favor, not just for, for myself, but for everybody. And that's about it, really. Let's fish for those who seek to stand in the way of God's kingdom, shall we, to pull them out of the way, to dismantle it rather than allow it to stand. So that's it. I'm done. Thank you. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.